I'm Valerie Jennings, uh, the Interim Executive Director for the Tolton Spirituality Center. We want to extend a warm welcome to each of you, to the members of the, the Tolton Ambassadors, the Tolton Guild, and to this fourth in five series on the, on the life of our very own venerable Father Augustus Tolton. Bishop Joseph Perry, our Episcopal Vicar for Vicariate Six, will continue the journey and speak to the embodiment of forgiveness that Father Tolton exhibited despite all the roadblocks that were placed before him. Father Tolton embraced the words of the prophet Micah of what is required for each of us. Do what's right, love goodness, and walk humbly with your God. This evening, we're requesting you not videotape this presentation. This and all other presentations will be uploaded on YouTube for your viewing at a later date. So now what I'd like for you to do is to please take a moment to silence all of your communication devices and place yourselves in the presence of the Holy Spirit for our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear God, thank you for your love, for the grace you freely offer. Feed us today with your daily bread. As the bread of life, your food, like manna, will sustain us throughout any trials and pangs of hunger. Help us to set our thoughts on things above, and to speak only what will help and encourage others. Make whatever work we do be marked with excellence rather than perfectionism as we seek not to make a name, but to make a difference. Help us to treat each person we encounter as you would with respect and love forgiving others, and asking for forgiveness for ourselves when needed. Help us model your ways when we make our amends to those we've hurt and offer our forgiveness to those who've injured us. Help us set aside selfishness and speak truth in love. Help us focus on our individual responsibility for forgiving others with grace so that our actions won't be conditional. We know we can forgive others because you first forgave us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bishop Perry is the Episcopal Vicar for Vicariate Six and the postulator for the cause for the sainthood of Father Tolton. If we think about how much God has forgiven us and those sins yet ahead of us, how can we keep count of the times that our brother or sister sins against us? Let us continue during this season of Easter exploring Father Tolton's life and what he has to teach us about forgiveness and how we move towards a place of healing. I give you our spiritual guide for the evening, Bishop Joseph Perry. Thank you, Valerie. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. 
As with each part of this series, we begin with a video. This one is a little different. The, there's a narrator or an interviewer who interviews a number of people who are close to the story of Father Tolton from Quincy, Illinois. One caution though, the woman in the video is not Tolton's mother. She's an actress or a reenactor or reenactress. Uh, she moves in that area down middle Illinois, putting on um, scenes and dramas about Tolton's life in the person of Martha Jane. So you, you won't be full, somehow discombobulated by <clears throat> who she is and what she's saying. And then afterwards, if you have any questions or comments, and then I'll have some words thereafter, okay? How's that? We ready? Good. <clears throat> Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Quincy at St. Peter's School with Reverend Augustine Tolton, the first African-American priest in the United States. What makes him so special, you might say? Well, he was born to a slave family which escaped and came to Illinois. He was not wanted in the priesthood but he stuck with it. And recently, the Catholic Church has begun proceedings looking into his possible sainthood. Here's the story. Okay, we're very fortunate to have the museum, the Gardner Museum of Architecture, to, uh, to bring this Father Tolton story to the audience. Matt Morris, you have done a considerable amount of work looking into the life of Father Tolton and actually developed a program as Father Tolton's mother uh, who was a very brave woman, apparently, because she was trying to raise a family in the slaveholding state of Missouri and came to the conclusion that, that she was not going to be able to do that. Um, so first let me ask you, though, personally, what made you attracted to the Tolton story and got you to want to develop this program? Well, I think it was the strength that Martha had. and. Um, Martha reminded me of my grandmother who had 13 children and had to take care of them herself mm -hmm. in Mississippi during the Jim Crow days. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just, I was drawn to her strength and, and her willingness to do whatever it took to take care of her family. Mm -hmm. Just for a little background now, your, your, uh, your husband, Ms. Mrs. Tolton's husband, joined the Union forces. He did. He, so in, a, in essence, deserted the family to join the Army. Well, they never felt deserted because they always felt this, the presence of his spirit there because of the reasons that he left. He left because he wanted freedom for the family and mm -hmm. also he wanted the children to be educated, which was not possible in the state of Missouri because slaves were not allowed to be educated. Okay. So there was never a feeling of abandonment Okay. So, so the, really the first part of the story starts when you leave Missouri and go to Illinois. So I'm going to let you to bring that to life for us. I'm just going to get out of the way here, okay? Okay, thank you. After Peter went to join the Union Army in Missouri, word came to me that he had died in a hospital in St. Louis. And then I wondered, Lord, what am I going to do? I've got three children to raise, enslaved, and it's breaking my heart to see them out in the fields in the hot sun of Missouri every day. So I decided there was only one thing I could do, escape across to Illinois where Peter had told me about the Underground Railroad system there. And I made up my mind. I packed up my three children, two boys pulling at my skirt, tails, and my baby Anne, eight months old, in my arm. 
And I knew the dangers of trying to escape because I was afraid that if nothing else, my baby would cry out and they would discover us. But I had to try because I know that's what Peter would want me to do. So we escaped and we made our way to Hannibal. We traveled by night in the, in the, the dark and we got a little help from the moonlight. During the day, the slaves in the fields would help us. They would give us food and water and hide us while we rest. We made it to Hannibal. And as soon as we got to Hannibal, a bunch of Confederate soldiers caught us. And they were about to put us in chains. And another faction of federal soldiers came and said that we were with them. And they gave us to these soldiers and they put us on an old raggedy rowboat down at the Mississippi River. Now I'd never rowed on a rowboat before, but I didn't care. I started rowing, that boat was going this way and it was going that way and this way and that way. We were headed to freedom. And we got a little ways out into the river and the Confederate soldiers saw us. And they start yelling at us. Hey, you, they start calling us names. And then all of a sudden, pow, pow, pow. They start shooting a gun at me and my babies and it scared us to death. My babies were crying and I was crying. I got them quieted down and I prayed that God wouldn't let them shoot us. And then it was really quiet out in that river. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. And early in the morning, I could see the shores of Mississippi. And we got closer. There were men on the banks and I, my heart went to my feet. I thought, oh God, not the bounties. Don't let them get us after all we've been through to get here. As we got closer, they were German fishermen and they recognized us as runaways and they took us off of that old beautiful dilapidated rowboat. They gave us food and water and a place to rest and they showed us how to get to Quincy so that we could work and get with the Underground Railroad system to our freedom. Father Roy Bauer, you not only have you had a long career as a priest, but you grew up in Quincy. So sort of like Father Tolton, you went to Quincy schools and, and, and all that. And, and as a result of that, you're very familiar with Father Tolton, aren't yes, you? Yes, I have been all my life. He had a kind of a tough go, didn't he? Yes, indeed. Um, in his, uh, w w by, by the time he got to Quincy, then of course there was a problem about his education at St. Boniface School, uh, where he was rejected by the other students and by the parents mm -hmm. of the other students. And so uh, he had to leave that school. And that was when uh, Father Peter McGare at um, St. Uh, Lawrence, the church was called at that time, it's now St. Peter's, uh, accepted him in St. Peter's School, and so he got a lot of his basic education then at uh, uh, St. Peter's School. And he, he also worked, he was only able to go to school uh, when he was not employed. Uh, he worked in a, uh, a tobacco factory down at 5th and, uh, and Payson Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, then in the wintertime when that was closed is when he uh, uh, went, to, went to school at St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. Is, is it your sense that he always wanted to be a priest? Well, yeah, well, I kind of think so. You know, because it, he served Mass every day. Uh, and, you know, eventually, I, I don't know whether Father McGear brought it up or whether he brought it up to Father McGear about uh, studying to be a, be a priest. But then he's got more education, you know, at uh, uh, St. Francis College at Quincy University. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he, he must have uh, been aware that there were no black priests in the United States. Yes, I'm sure he was. Um, there were three priests before him who were partially black, but they were not recognizable as black. Uh, they were from Georgia. Their dad was an Irishman. Uh, the mom was a very light-skinned slave, 
and uh, so his the the children were technically slaves, but the but the, the uh, they were not recognized as blacks. And mm -hmm. then the dad w sent them up north for these are the Healy brothers. They talk about the Healy brothers, and uh, sent them up north so they would not you know people would identify them as black and mm -hmm. as as slaves. And one of the Healys became uh, eventually became the uh, bishop in the state of Maine. Uh, one became the pastor of Holy Cross Cathedral in Boston, and the other became the rector of uh, a Catholic University in wow. uh, D.C. Pretty successful people. Yes. Uh huh. Oh uh, wow! And so, in D.C., it's so interesting that they, at the time, they did not admit black students, but the rector of the mm -hmm. of the school actually, you know, was mm -hmm. uh, partially black. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether uh, August Tolton was aware of them, you yeah. know, that, uh, uh, but, yeah. so. But, but he must have known, just given his experiences, that he was kind of fighting an uphill battle, wasn't yes. he? Yes, uh -huh. he, he ran into roadblocks all the, all the way through, even in just trying to get an education and then uh, clear on, uh, it, without Father McGurr, I guess, it, it would not have been possible. That's probably true, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he, you mentioned that he had certain qualities which make him saintly, and and I and I think I think one of them said you say he was a long-suffering <laughs> yeah. individual. Describe that. To yeah. Him. Okay. And uh, in the old catechisms of the Catholic Church, they talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That if a person uh, has the, has the Holy Spirit, what the fruit of the gifts of the Spirit are, what a person's life is like. And one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit was called long suffering. Now, nowadays in the Catechism, they don't use that expression. They just use the word patience. Mm -hmm. Well, the word patience, you know, people use that word all the time. You know, they say, I got impatient waiting for the traffic light to change. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really like that expression, long suffering, because it means that a person will, if you know you're doing what is right, uh, you, that you're, you're going to follow through no matter what the uh, trials or tribulations mm -hmm. are going to be. And I think that would be the outstanding. Uh, uh, somebody asked me, they said, you know, you Catholics pray to St. Anthony to find things that you pray to, you, different saints. What about Father Tolton? Well, is there something special? Yeah, pray to him for the, for the gift of long suffering, you know, that you can put up with uh, distressful things as long as you know you're doing what's right just continue mm -hmm. to do what is right mm -hmm. so and you know it's kind of ironic too because you take this man who was capable of putting up with so much and then to die at such an early age you know he would have gladly suffered many many more oh, years wouldn't yes. he? I mean it was a very 43 years old yeah mm -hmm. pitiful Joanne Fry we've heard the name Father McGurr numerous times when we're talking about Father Tolton Turns out he was a relative of yours, and right. tell me if I'm right, right, great, great, great uncle. Correct. Okay, and and everybody in the in the family knew his story and his relationship with Father Tolton. Mm -hmm. He, Father Tolton, probably would never have, maybe never gotten an education, and certainly would not have become a priest without no. Father McGurr. How, how did all that happen? Well, the it was the custom for the um, owners of the slaves to uh, educate the family in their religion, the owner's religion. Mm -hmm. So they were Catholic. And when they did come uh, fleeing from Brush Creek, Missouri, they came and were in Quincy and the mother found work at a tobacco factory and she placed um, Augustus in the school at St. Boniface. Mm -hmm. But the white mothers complained. Mm -hmm. And so the priest hated to tell her, but he, he felt that he w must because maybe the other people would take the children out of school. Oh, yeah. So she put him in the colored school. He was about 14. He was big and he had not learned to read. He hadn't been in school mm. long, long enough to read. And so then he um, was made fun of by the older kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also called him names because his father wasn't around. His father had joined the Union Army and mm -hmm. gone to St. Louis. Uh, they probably didn't know 
that the father died of of uh, infection while he was in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And uh, with all that happening, it was no wonder he didn't want to be in school. Mm -hmm. And so Father McGurr saw him on the street and said, Gus, why aren't you in school? <laughs> and he heard the story. He said, you come to my school. And Father McGurr's housekeeper was also his niece. And he said, if anybody comes from the church and wants to discuss this matter, tell them that I will speak to them at Mass. In other words, they would get a story, a, a sermon about mm -hmm. being tolerant. Mm -hmm. he, he saw something special in Father Tolton. Yes. And, and Father Tolton, I assume, wanted to become a priest because he respected Father McGurr so much. Um, after time went on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Father McGurr saw that he not, had tutoring by the brothers that were almost next door mm -hmm. because Quincy College started uh, across the street. Yeah. Father Zimmerman, way back in, uh, I, well, you told me the year, uh, maybe 1997, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. you helped put together a 100th anniversary uh, for, for the death and, and, and right. a commemoration for the death of Father Tolton. You and Father Bauer did that. And I'm sure that was Father Bauer's, it was largely his initiative because he was pastor at St. Peter's he commissioned a statue of Father Tolton at St. Peter's, which is there on the grounds, you know, up against the school. Mm -hmm. And he renamed the old convent there, Tolton Hall. And you can see that big sign there when you go to St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and so you had people really from all over, all over the country. Yes, we tried here. to get people, especially over the Midwest, but we had, we had Archbishop Regali from St. Louis, and I believe there were like 15 bishops you know, that came from mm -hmm. all over. And so, uh, yeah, we had. Yeah. So you became sort of a de, a de facto go-to guy when it came mm -hmm. to Tolton. You yeah. and Father Bauer. Did. The two of us, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and he, it, he, know, he knows more about it. You know, well, like he, I think he told you that he used to had some contact with the church before it was torn down, mm -hmm. where Father uh, Tolton, you know, yeah. ministered. And so. yeah. Now recently, uh, Rome has become aware of Father Tolton's gifts and is considering him for statehood, and in fact, you and Father Bauer were sainthood. I'm sorry, for sainthood. <laughs> God, I'm doing a different story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you uh -huh. and Father Bauer were invited to Chicago mm -hmm. for sort of a fact finding. Uh, it, it was an, it was a kind of a liturgical. Uh, it took place in this chapel, a beautiful little chapel, which is a copy of the Saint Chapelle in Paris, and it's a magnificent little church. And the place was packed. I mean, uh, and then they had. Uh, you know, they had prayers and readings and all that. Mm -hmm. And then I remember at one part of the ceremony, they they named certain people who were going to be in charge of keeping the the evidence for this uh, mm -hmm. for this canonization. And then they had to take an oath and sign papers and all that. And that was mm -hmm. all part of the ceremony. Yeah. And and this canonization can can take a long time. Yes, it, it can. It's, it's mm -hmm. a very a strict. They follow very strict proceedings, mm -hmm. don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things they have to do is 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 prove that or beyond at least to satisfy them, that, that Father Tolton was involved in a couple of miracles. Yes. Mm -hmm. And is there any evidence of such a thing? As I say, I heard a story of one, and I don't know the details of it, so mm -hmm. I really don't think I should talk about it, but that's all I know right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when, he was, when he was in Quincy, um, b trying to get an education, mm -hmm. it was a very difficult thing for him to do because blacks at the time, it was not a ready thing, was it? It was something right. that somebody had to really get behind and, and, and mm -hmm. help him along. What See, slavery, like? slavery really discouraged any kind of educating of slaves. It was dangerous even to learn to read. And so, uh, and I think that, that attitude rubbed off, you know, even though slavery was gone for 15 years by the time he went to the seminary way, it still, those attitudes linger, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And how did he finally get to the seminary? Well, uh, Father McGurr at St. Peter's worked with him, and uh, uh, let's see. See, there were some Franciscans at St. Francis College, which is now Quincy University, who, uh, who stepped in and kind of tutored him. Mm -hmm. There was another priest, I think, at St. Boniface who tutored him too, and maybe even two of them, uh, as I recall, that uh, gave him private lessons of various mm -hmm. kinds, and they, they taught him, you know, taught him, I guess, languages and uh, religion and things like that. And uh, the most important person in, my, in the story that I tell is Father Michael Rickard, who was a Franciscan at St. At Francis College. 
uh, who was involved in helping him. He, I think Father Michael had also uh, begun some kind of a catechism program down at the St. Joseph's Church. This was before Father Tilton was ever ordained. Mm -hmm. He was ministering to black Catholics in Quincy. And he had, he had uh, Augustus Tilton working at this church, giving lessons to the children there, see? And uh, so when it came time for him to go for a seminary, they, they kept writing to seminaries all over the country and nobody would accept him. Uh, I think part of it was that there were laws in many states that said that a black and a white cannot stay overnight in the same place, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to get in trouble for, for that yeah. kind of thing. And then uh, I just recently uh, read an account that said, like in Teutopolis, Illinois, the <clears throat> Germans there were facing enough, um, enough uh, prejudice on, because they were German that they didn't want to handle another prejudice mm -hmm. dealing with race issues, so they, they didn't want to have him. Father Michael uh, wrote to Rome, and it turned out, uh, originally I think Father McGurr and even the bishop, I think, had written to Rome asking to get him into this seminary in Rome called the Propaganda. It, that's a Latin word that means uh, basically spreading of the faith, mm -hmm. you know. And um, they, they wouldn't accept him, but Father Michael uh, knew the Franciscan, head of the Franciscan order in Rome, and he knew the cardinal in charge of this seminary. And through that sort of, uh, who, you know, who knows who you know mm -hmm, connections, mm -hmm. uh, they got him admitted to the uh, seminary in Rome. And so that's how he got there and mm -hmm. uh, then went on to finish his studies and be ordained. Peggy Frankenhoff, you know, since Father Tolton has become so famous recently and because they're thinking about him for sainthood, anything that he signed or touched or had anything to do with has become very significant. And it turns out that you became aware you and your husband became, it came in possession of this some time ago. Yeah. And for those who don't know what it is, it's, it's a certificate of first communion, um, and it's certified that Father Tolton presided at this, at this ceremony. Well, how, did you, how did you come to own it? I believe it's a baptismal. Baptismal? Since baptismal, yes. Okay. Uh, bought it at an auction, mm -hmm. and I think the auction was uh, of a colored family and uh, they had it there, and he recognized who it was. And Your husband did? Yes, yeah. and uh, someone else had bought it, and he uh, wanted me to ask them if they would sell it. Mm -hmm. They did. Yeah, and, and it, you know, it's really beautiful. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. so not mm -hmm. only do you have something that's historically significant, but you got something that's pretty as well. Lots of color. Yeah, lots of color. So you're not gonna part with it, are you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's really neat. Not today. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> When Gus was ordained in Rome, he was sent back to Illinois, he came back to Quincy, and he did his first high mass at St. Boniface Church. People came from all around to hear him. And when he was done with his high mass, they assigned him to minister to the colored people at St. Joseph's Church in Quincy. And every Sunday, that church was filled with black and white Catholics because they wanted to hear Gus. He was a great speaker, and they could feel God coming through him. He loved the Lord, and he never failed to let everyone know that. There was a priest named Father Weiss, and he was angry with Gus because all the the parishioners came from other churches to his church. Every Sunday they would come to hear him and left hardly no one at the white church. So he told Father Tolton that he should turn down all the white people that came to his church because that, though he was supposed to, to preach just to the colors. Well, Gus couldn't go for that. That wasn't who he was. And rather than cause a lot of trouble and, and hard feelings, he chose to find a place to go. And he tried different areas. He wanted to go to Boston, but nobody had a spot for him. And finally, they accepted him in Chicago because there was a need to minister to the colored Catholics in Chicago. So he moved to Chicago and um, went to St. Monica's Church and at the time, they didn't have a building. They actually had their services at St. Mary's Church in the basement. 
he worked very, very hard to minister to those people because they were poor and he, they were hungry and he saved all of the souls. He did fundraisers and finally they were able to build their own church, St. Monica's in Chicago. And that's where he worked tirelessly. He didn't think of himself. He always thought of others and he, he denied himself and he worked so hard, he didn't think about his health. And he did speeches and talks and traveling and all the money that he raised came back to the church. At the age of 43 years old, which is so young, he fell dead from a heat stroke. He had just come from a retreat and in the hot sun in Chicago at the age of 43, he fell dead. Well, Iris Nelson, you're the research librarian at the Quincy Library, and much of what we know about Father Tolton is actually written in a biography from some years ago by a sister, a Catholic nun, who was mm -hmm. sort of going through the Tolton experience. She was teaching black children in Chicago. Yes, that's right. And she was teaching, it was her first year of teaching in 1933. She was teaching to black children in Chicago. She learned of St. Monica's, which was gone at that time, but she learned of St. Monica's and Father Tolton mm -hmm. while she was in her first year of teaching. And that basically set off her curiosity to continue the research for 40 years. Wow. This book was published in 1973. So for many of her years, she was interviewing, for example, Tolton's parishioners. Mm -hmm. She was interviewing his mother and his sister. And there was um, a sister, Drexel, who helped him financially at different times. Mm -hmm. So she got these first-person accounts of what we have a very precious book in this, in the sense that without her doing that footwork, we wouldn't know the full story mm -hmm. of Father Tolton. Yeah, and in fact, somebody like Matt Morris, who has put another more time into this, yes. was inspired and instructed by much of what's in this book. Exactly. Yeah. She would not know how she came across the river in a rowboat, how tough it was with the guns firing at mm -hmm. the boat, and the children being scared and then having to be quieted, and the fears she would have had just going across the river for the first time in mm -hmm. a rowboat. Mm -hmm. So all of that comes to us for the, you know, to add the richness to Father Tolton's story. Right, right. Um, so she did the research. She has a lot of documents. She traveled many places. She worked very hard for many years to uh, get the story published. So we owe her a debt in that sense. I'm sure it was a great labor of love. Um, but to work on something for 40 years in your spare time, I'm sure, wow. um, is, is certainly addition to mm -hmm. Father Tolton's story. And, and we should note, while I have you here in front of this painting, this painting hang, hung in the old St. Boniface Church yes. where Father Tolton would have seen it and he would have been aware of it uh, on a daily basis. So. Exactly. Excellent. So it's very significant yeah. that we're here today shooting mm -hmm. and we can have this as a backdrop yeah. for the story. If Father Tolton is canonized and becomes St. Augustine Tolton, it is said that the present St. Boniface Church, which is closed, could become a shrine. And Catholics from all over the world would come to learn about and pray to St. Augustine Tolton. With another Illinois story in Quincy, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Good. Any thoughts come to your mind? Any questions or comments or wonderments or yes? Um, I just want to say, watching that film, give bravery is in the DNA. If it's genetically Vegetarian area, then I can see why Augustus Tolton had the bravery and the strength to follow history because his mother followed her dream to leave Missouri, travel against all odds and the danger to Illinois to escape slavery and have a better life. So he had to look no further than her to follow history against all of the 
against all odds, uh, and then let that staff make the money with the increase. Yes, yeah, certainly, if, if it wasn't for his mother, we never would have heard of him. Um, and unbeknownst to her, with that escape <clears throat> to the state of Illinois, that launched her son into world history, so to speak, unbeknownst to them. It just was unimaginable at that time. Now, uh, Martha Jane and um, her daughter, Father Tolton's sister, are buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery on 111th Street. After father's death, they lived pretty much on 35th and Dearborn Street until her death in 1911. Anyone else? Where are you becoming experts in hey geography? <laughs> When we took a tour to Mercy Hospital? Oh, that was part of uh, what we call the Chicago Tolton Tour. That's one of, that's the, I guess the last stop on that tour when it was still under Catholic auspices. It's no longer under Catholic auspices right now. But that's where Tolton died on July 9th, 1897. They had taken him to Mercy, which was ran by the Mercy Nuns. And they begged the sisters to take him in the hospital because an hospital did not take blacks in those days. And uh, <clears throat> the sisters did take him in. They recognized him because St. Monica's was just down the street about 10 blocks. Uh, the hospital was on 22nd and Prairie. And they took him in and they worked on him for about eight hours or so, but then he succumbed and died about 8.30 that evening. That's why we go to Mercy Hospital. Now I guess we have to just drive by it. <laughs> we can't go inside. Yeah, but uh, a picture of Tolton used to hang in their library in Mercy Hospital. Yeah. <clears throat> From slave to priest. Um, that was the uh, first definitive biography done on Father Tolton. It came out in about 19, 1973. Uh, sister's no longer alive, but her, her blood sister gave me the copy of the original manuscript for the book. Uh, the, the documentary there showed a different cover. With the reprinting of this, they have a new cover. It's called From Slave to Priest. You can get it on Amazon.com. Amazon has everything, you know. Um, but that was the first, the first attempt at writing a biography of Tolton. And then um, once the research was sent over to Rome, uh, we came out with uh, Augustus Tolton, The Church is the True Liberator. This is an update and has uh, things that were not available in archives when this was written. So this um, improved on this to some degree. And uh, this is written by Joyce Duriga, who is the editor of Chicago Catholic here in the Archdiocese. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the process of you know, the length of time that it takes, what's required uh, for him to become a saint? Sure. The process and the t uh, what's all involved. <clears throat> Unknown caller. Well, when the uh, 
when we sent the dust, it took us about four and a half years to do the research on him, uh, going into libraries and archives and newspaper clippings and things of that nature. Um, and in September of 2014, we sent the dossier over to Rome. It took Rome almost about five years uh, to study all of that. And then on June 11th of 2019, Pope Francis named him Venerable, which advanced him from servant of God's status to the next status upwards, which means that um, the, the decree reads that Augustus Tolton lived a life of heroic virtue for the times within which he lived. So his story was credible. Rome accepts his story. <clears throat> and now we're in the miracle phase of um, asking God to uh, give us a guarantee that he's upstairs and not the other place. And um, we get the blue ribbon seal of approval on him. From heaven, Annette asks for uh, an inexplicable turnaround in health that medicine cannot explain for someone who's in a desperate situation. Uh, that's needed for being beatified, being called blessed. And then after that, an additional miracle to be declared a saint. So they were in the miracle phase right now. We went from servant of God to venerable, the first two. So we're halfway there. I would like to think we're halfway there, but we'll see. <laughs> Could you tell us what the variables are that you're proposing or presenting? No, I can't. You can't. We're not allowed to talk about them until Rome approves. Mm -hmm. And for, the, for this reason, um, <clears throat> When you present uh, stories of these turnarounds in health, uh, some of them are proved, some of them are not. And uh, once news gets out that there is a story, well then the press will not leave the person alone. And if it's not approved, then people can go into a state of depression that somehow God did not approve of them or didn't answer their prayers or something of that nature. So it's a very sensitive piece of the process. Uh, you don't know you have a miracle until Rome tells you you have a miracle. <laughs> Everything else prior to that is tentative. <laughs> but if you know anyone we can raise from the dead, just let me know and we will process it and send it over. <clears throat> So the possibility of sainthood for the venerable Father Augustus Tolton embodies extraordinary and unprecedented stature at all levels of the church. Uh, he, as you heard from the documentary, is the first of African descent uh, to be the, whom history acknowledges as a priest in our country. Um, Protestants generally accuse the church of disloyalty or putting forward a fake priest and not a real one because they could not imagine, some of the detractors could not imagine uh, the Catholic church putting a Roman collar around the neck of a black man. Given the customs and the lawless customs of the time that were prevail. So that's why he turns out to be something of an anomaly in the white community, but obviously a new sensation in the black community. We have almost 200 some newspaper clippings on Tolton that were written in various newspapers around the country, all during his life from the time that he left uh, to study in Rome until his death. And uh, these journalists 
almost kept a diary on him, following him. And Totner was very much aware of that, but he was also afraid of it as well. Those of you who perhaps saw the movie uh, 12 Years a Slave, with Brian uh, Pitt, excuse me, Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt, and uh, the Nigerian actor um, Chiwetel Ejiofor, who starred as Nathaniel Northrup, uh, who was a man recaptured and thrown back into slavery, and his family didn't know where he was for 12 years. And um, that was the era that Toten grew up in. Uh, it was an era where the South were uh, enumerating and listing their their wounds or their travails, and they wanted to somehow repurpose the Confederacy. And the only way to do that was to get blacks off of the gains that they had obtained after emancipation and, and through the tumultuous period of reconstruction. And Tolton was very afraid that that would happen to him. That's why he left no paper trail behind. Uh, he promised his mother and his sister that as soon as he got settled here in Chicago, he would send for them because he feared they would go after his mother and sister and take them back to Missouri. There was always a possibility. Why would the Catholic Church defy the laws of the land by placing a collar around the neck of a black man? Uh, that would haunt Tolton all of his priesthood. The backdrop for his life and virtues is a time where words like <clears throat> segregation, racism, discrimination were unknown in popular parlance in those days. Uh, those words were not in the English lexicon, and those terms would not emerge at least until after World War II during the protracted fight for civil rights. So consequently, uh, Tolton uh, was a solitary figure for the times that were socially not yet ripe for notions of racial equality. That was most unimaginable in the 19th century. So as a result of the unrelenting challenges that he incurred while remaining steadfast to his priestly vows, uh, Father Tolton became a symbol of fidelity and priestly dignity and pastoral charity to both white and black, and that's why he got into trouble. It was illegal for us to be in a room like this together as white and black, unless there was permission granted by someone who <laughs> owned the place or was in the authority to do so. All through the Jim Crow era, as you know, we blacks had to go in rear doors, never the front doors, um, if we were allowed at all, and never to sit or to eat or to lodge in the same place where whites occupied. So he endured a kind of resentment and a personal suffering during a less than socially tolerant era of our nation's history. Some of us have memories of it as our grandparents and great-grandparents spoke of their experiences. You know, my paternal grandmother spoke of attending mass on Sunday in the rear of the church in the last several pews. And sometimes they would run out of Eucharist. If they ran out of Eucharist, the blacks did not receive. Uh, otherwise, you sat in balcony, um, but you could not kneel at the communion railing with whites to receive the Eucharist. These kinds of things sound rather odd and strange to us, but they were very real at that time, as you know. So if it wasn't for his mother, Martha, Augustus would have been just one of, I suppose, countless courageous black men who faded into history unknown. But her daring escape from bondage launched him into history as a pioneer 
of ministry turned toward the church's uh, black children. Also a pioneer in racial integration in the church at a time in which the church did not have the time or the energy, let alone the courage to address it head on. Tolton began the long procession of just a few young black men who would don the white collar of the Roman Catholic priesthood. There's another book called uh, Desegregating the Altar that's written by Stephen Ox, O-C-H-S. I might have referred to it in previous sessions. That is um, a story of the Josephite Fathers from Baltimore, and that describes the, the, the men who came after Tolton, some of whom experienced things worse than Tolton ever imagined, a couple of them with nervous breakdowns, because once they were ordained, the bishops in the South would not allow them to minister in their parishes. So many of them were, ended up being ordained and they had no work to do. Some of them were given work, and then if the bishop changed, it was snatched away from them, depending upon who the bishop was. Um, the U.S. Civil War ended in 1865, officially, and then reconstruction of the country thereafter really was less than the making of a new nation, or bringing a nation together, and more about uh, bringing the Confederacy back into existence with people clinging to the core values of the South at that time. Racial intolerance, elitism, privilege to name a few. The Ku Klux Klan was just getting underway. Southern state legislators enacted laws that were intended to once again control the behavior and the movement of former slaves as African Americans were barred from classrooms and bathrooms, from theaters and train cars, from colleges and universities, juries and legislatures, eating establishments, neighborhoods where whites lived, including cemeteries. One of the reasons why Tolton collapsed was on that particular week <clears throat> that he died, Chicago was going through this famous heat waves. You've had several of them over recent years where people were found dead in their homes or whatever, especially the elderly uh, who have their windows locked, their doors locked, and they don't know what the real temperature is outside, and they get overcome by the heat. Well, in those days, trains, depending upon the length of where they were traveling, would have at most maybe one car where blacks could, could travel. And if there weren't enough seats, you had to stand until they got to a station where people got off. And in a hot, muggy train, I mean, there was no electricity. And God only knows if air was really passing through with the movement of the train, um, people could pass out <laughs> easily. <clears throat> the Catholic Church, with the exception of some priests and religious women, was, was rather timid in standing up to the injustice of slavery in its aftermath, with the laws that codified in many places discrimination and segregation in American institutions. Unknown caller. A misstep that drove many slaves to become Protestants and freed slaves to create their own churches. Um, it was mentioned rather obliquely in the documentary where the Germans <clears throat> were experiencing their own nature, their own prejudice uh, for being German and especially for being Catholic. And the church was preoccupied with the settlement of Europeans who were coming here poor and dejected and persecuted from the lands of, from which they came. Um, it, for some reason or another, they just couldn't eke out an attention given to poor blacks who had nothing were considered nothing by the society within which they lived, people with, him, with whom they had never had contact with. So we were a lost group, an unfortunate group at that time. African Americans, as a result, uh, have a deep and troubling history with the Catholic Church. Uh, there was a time when um, 
we just were not accepted in our educational institutions, as you saw in the documentary already beginning in elementary school. And even if the church here and there showed signs of an intention to help, they were not quite brave enough to really counter prevailing prejudices and reach out to the condition of blacks in this country, despite repeated counsel to do so from authorities, even in Rome. They asked the American bishops to do something about the slaves, the freed slaves especially, but uh, they never got much of a response from this side. Our church always had heroic individuals, but we just did not have a corporate program with which to deal with that situation. Uh, we had people like Father Peter McGurr and Michael Rickard, Sister Herlinda Sick, the Notre Dame sister who tutored Tolton. We had a Catherine Drexel. We had Peter Claver way back in the 1600s, meeting the slave ships at Cartagena and dedicating his life to that work until the day he died. Uh, we always had individuals, but not a holistic approach to this. Yet in all this, Tolton did not meet back to anyone the hatred that he experienced, but came off with his faith and his hope and his love are found intact with a profound respect for the church that rescued him in his youth and brought him to stature as a holy man of God. If you can imagine it, <clears throat> once going over to Rome, which is a very cosmopolitan city, there is no race prejudice you find in Italy. Uh, Rome has, uh, has always had all kinds of peoples, slaves, people in, in between and free and patricians and wealthy people. And so everybody had their own station in life. But slavery in those days was not premised on race. It was premised on conquest. So we had all kinds of people who were um, enslaved you could say whites, browns, yellows, in between, any kind of, any kind of folk. But um, Tolton found that a very freeing experience and the six years that he lived there, uh, he just loved it. He loved it immensely. And only to come back here and to be uh, placed on a cross, to have to go through all of that again as a priest here in the United States, unbeknownst to the authorities, uh, they did not realize the seriousness of the situation here to the terms in which they should have. Tolton was blessed with a disposition of serenity in face of the harshness of that era. And he leaves us with an emblem of faithful suffering service, or as Father Bauer mentions there, long suffering amidst charity for all regardless of who they were. One sign of the nobility of his character, I think, is not so much mentioned in any of his biographers, was his desire expressed to his mother that if anything happened to him, he was to be buried in Quincy. Not in Chicago, but in Quincy, Illinois. His grave is in Quincy to this day. We exhumed him in 2016. Father Tolton's desire to be buried in the town where he grew up was a signal of his forgiveness for all things untoward that were thrown at him there as a young man and as a priest. Things said and done to him in that town. But he still harbored an affection for the town and its people. He was able to distinguish the chaff from the wheat, to use the Lord's parable which is the stuff of holiness, which is the stuff of Christian faith and lifestyle. Uh, this is what it means to live the gospel as a saint. When we can forgive that which is unforgivable. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, as the Lord uttered from the cross. But Father Tolton believed and preached over and over that the Catholic Church was the chief instrumental means 
for the emancipation of the black man. He believed that sincerely, inspired as he was by several representatives of the church and its priests and nuns who rescued him in his youth and saw to his eventual ordination as a priest of the Catholic Church. In those days, there, were, there was no national welfare program to help poor people. You had to eke out whatever existence that you could. You know, there was no, no assistance. That's why a Tolton living on the south side of Chicago along Dearborn and State Streets, that area where the black community was pretty much confined along with the poor and shanty Irish, as they were called in those days. Uh, he was the source of food and clothing and counsel and ministry and all that put up together, and he was by himself doing that. Mm -hmm. Tolton is an example of a black man who traversed the black saga with dignity and bearing. He was a true Christian. And his perseverance against large odds is what has paved a hopeful way for all of us. He was a pioneer of affirmative race relations in this country before anyone imagined there was such a thing. In his life, he was recipient simultaneously of two sides of human nature. The worst that human beings could mete out to another human being, and then the nobility of human nature that was seen in some really visionary and far-reaching individuals like Sister Erlinda and Father Peter McGear and Michael Rickard, and those who helped him along the way. It's our hope and prayer that the church can overturn the many no's that were thrown so often at Tolton throughout his life by finally saying yes and acknowledging his suffering service and his priestly fidelity and then raise him to the altars. Such an honor, I think, would give credence to the suffering participation of black Catholics and other Christians and cement a rightful place for black Catholics alongside other ethnic groupings who have their saints in our church founded by Jesus Christ. Any questions? Mr. Perry, is there any knowledge of any type of interaction of the Healy brothers even after the death of Father Toto, were they still around at that particular time? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sherwood became the rector of Georgetown University. <clears throat> I was at Georgetown University for some meetings a couple months back, and his name is still in the front of the building. Um, Michael Healy, <laughs> there were many like him. He was a successful Irish businessman. But sometimes um, successful men had their other habits. They weren't so kosher. So he had a slave woman whom he never married. But several of his children were fair enough by way of complexion they could pass for white. What is not mentioned until you get into the story behind the Healy's, he had three daughters also who were all he put in convents. Uh, they could hide rather effectively by reason of the habits that the nuns wore in those days. One of them left the convent, but two of them remained. And um, um, one of them became a ship captain, and then, of course, James was the first to uh, acknowledge black bishop. He probably was more vociferous of the sons. He did not want to be known as a black man. He resented that immensely. So he never made them Yeah. 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 No, so they never, they never was part of the black community. Uh, we do know 
Bishop Healy was invited several times to African American events, and he always refused. Now, Was it ever a formal vote? The, they got as far as the first level. It was never completed by time of his death. The picture that, uh, the photograph of the church, it appears in here, uh, shows the first level where they used for worship. But uh, you can see it is incomplete. The only thing I can compare it to, remember St. Dorothy Church here on the south side? It was almost like that. Dorothy Church was a church that was never finished. That's why it looks like you had a lower level with a low ceiling. That was St. That was Monica's. They tore it down in 1945. Once the war was finished, the city of Chicago was looking for land to build housing for returning veterans. So they commandeered 35th and 36th in Dearborn streets to build um, Chicago public housing. And they put up a public housing unit on that corner where the church used to be. Stateway Gardens. <clears throat> I ran into an elderly woman who's now deceased. She told me that when she was a girl, her and her friends used to play on the stones that were torn down from the church and then how they hauled the stones of the church and they put them on the shore of Lake Michigan to offset erosion. So those relics are down there. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why um, St. Elizabeth has been very important to us. Um, and I can kind of go back um, the importance of us coming and calling this our mother church. Um, I always feel that it's important for us as we know history for us to go back to explain to our new Commerce uh, to the church and why we do things like we do. Um, and looking at Father Tolton, um, many things that he did, we find today that we still do. Um, it's important, and I find that it's important to us. And, and during this um, Lenten season, uh, for some reason, it became very important to me. Um, there was times, uh, right, especially right before uh, Holy Week, um, it was it was almost like I was walking with him, um, and I started to write. So, I, throughout this um, time this year, I began to write. Um, what I was feeling and beginning to really feel that Father Tolton. Uh, as one of the Tolton ambassadors here for Chicago, which we were the founding uh, Tolton ambassadors, um, we constantly, with our meeting, we open and we close with Father Tolton's prayer. Um, education for us is very important. Uh, and doing Black History uh, Month, we uh, meet with the students throughout the uh, city of Chicago uh, who enjoy them with their mass that they do down downtown in Holy Name. Uh, at that particular time, we submit information to the schools for them to do an essay. And those essays are for the fifth through the eighth grade. And um, those students write the essays, they're um, reviewed, 
and they're to be turned back to us back on Sunday. So this means they had this period of time to write them and get them to us. This is our week that we have acknowledged the uh, essay winners. We had uh, a lunch uh, for them, and at that particular luncheon, which we do every year, uh, they, the winners read their essay at the luncheon, or the preface, whichever one that we have, and they are given a, uh, a computer or, or a tablet. Um, that event will happen this weekend. We do have our uh, winners, and um, they will read that to us this, this coming Saturday. Um, that will be at Benedict the Africa. And of course, for those who are interested, um, you can ask a couple of our ambassadors. I don't know if there's anyone else here um, to let them know if they, you would be interested in coming. The luncheon is at 12 o'clock and it is uh, $25. But um, we know that education is very, very important to us. And so we strive um, to work with the, even not only just the Catholic schools, we have kids that are in public schools. Many of us, I can start with myself, but I was in public school. Um, and, but I made sure every Wednesday, I always like every Wednesday, I was going down to St. Anselm um, for my CCD. But um, or having Father Tolton to be the center of all we're saying, I think it's very important that we not only get it into our parishes, but also into our schools. Um, to make them aware of uh, the importance of this man who had to leave from, you know, uh, Quincy uh, to get too long to be ordained. Um, and as we're coming up now to Congress, how important Black Catholic Congress is to us um, and how we should acknowledge that because he was also a part of that and was one of the speakers. For those who may not know the history. After Tolton died, um, the di uh, Cardinal Mundelein had assigned a diocesan priest to St. Monica's for several years. And then he merged St. Monica's with St. Elizabeth's here at the time. So that's from 1926 on up to recent times. That's where that history is. And that's the one reason why we're trying to hold on to this place as a Tolton Spirituality Center because this is where everything was moved or, or, or transferred. Mother Catherine Drexel would come here rather frequently. Her sisters were teaching here and at St. Monica's for a number of years up until about 2000, 2001. I was wondering how, we don't have a lot of documentation from Tolton himself, but how was he received among the bishops, his own bishop in Quincy, um, that him requesting the transfer here? How, how was he perceived in the institutional church? It was kind of spotty, uh, given what was available by way of communication in those days, and people didn't travel much. He had a, uh, a corresponding relationship with Cardinal Gibbons. Cardinal Gibbons invited him several different times to come and address audiences out there in Baltimore. Um, Patrick Fian here in Chicago came to his rescue and brought him here to Chicago. Uh, the Archbishop of St. Paul, Minneapolis, uh, was a little bit more persnickety because I guess Tolton had sought out the possibility of transferring to the Twin Cities. Um, but the Archbishop there left some remarks that 
ended up in the biography that aren't too complimentary. <laughs> um, those are the only prelates outside of the prelates in Rome, Giovanni Simeone and uh, Cardinal Parocchi who ordained him in his class. It was, it was very small. Uh, there wasn't, he didn't have that much of a public persona in that sense. No. We don't. Mm -mm. No. Okay, we don't want to keep you too long. We could um, end with uh, the totem canonization prayer. Because I'm sure... Some of you probably have to get home and prepare supper. <laughs> Do you have uh, Father Tolton's canonization prayer available, it's either on the, the pamphlet or the prayer card itself? Thereby have it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O oh God, we give you thanks for your servant and priest, Father Augustus Tolton, who labored among us in times of contradiction, times that were both beautiful and paradoxical. His ministry helped lay the foundation for a truly Catholic gathering and faith in our time. We stand in the shadow of his ministry. May his life continue to inspire us and imbue us with that confidence and hope that will forge a new evangelization for the church we love. Father in heaven, Father Tolton's suffering service sheds light upon our sorrows. We see them through the prism of your son's passion and death. If it be your will, O oh God, Glorify your servant, Father Tolton, by granting the favor I now ask through his intercession. So that all may know the goodness of this priest whose memory looms large in the church he loved. Complete what you have begun in us that we might work for the fulfillment of your kingdom, not to us the glory, but glory to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are God, living and reigning forever and ever. Amen. By all means, um, highlight the cause of Father Tolton in your prayer, in your own narratives with people whom you know or love. Prayer is the most important for the success of a cause of this nature, so we ask your prayers that way. Thanks for keeping up with us as we move closer in this great venture and hope that it can be successful one day. Thank you all very much for coming. We'll see you next, next what's the date is the last one? The 10th. The 10th, that'll be the last of our five part series. We'll see you then. Thank you. God bless. Okay. Um, Antoinette has some surveys for you in the back, and I believe that she has kind of like two door prizes. So you want to come forward, Antoinette? We just want to you know, say I thank you again for being so attentive and for consistently coming back for the last uh, four weeks. So we're, I, can't, I, I really don't know how we're going to end this, Bishop Perry. So it's, 
It will be because it's all things Tolton. So I'm not quite sure of what that means. Okay. Okay, the winners today are Tanya Morgan and Mark Franzen. Still here? All right. Tanya? And if you'll just leave those uh, surveys at the um, at the desk as you as you depart, be sure to take a few snacks with you, okay? And have a good evening and a safe trip home. <laughs>